Is it on now? It was sitting on the volume button.
It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom life changing to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And let's open our service by standing and singing, How Great Thou Art! about you coming today and uh, a couple of things to make note of we will have our adult seed group uh, this afternoon at five o'clock in the auditorium and that is both online and in person so you can come and take care of that and watch that as well and then we'll have our team will our teens will have their Sunday evening uh, meeting here in the in the um, in the pavilion here at six o'clock not at five o'clock we'll make note of that later and God has been so good. We're so excited about what God has been doing in our church lately. And we've seen a number of baptisms, a lot of visitors. And God has been uh, just manifesting himself and re revealing himself to our community. And I believe that the Lord is using this uh, pandemic to help us to help our community as well. And we're excited about that. Let's open in a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Uh, I believe we're going to have an offertory and we'll take our offering. 
And uh, well, let me just do this before. I'll pray for the offering as well. Praise the Lord for your faithfulness in giving. Our giving has not dropped off at all. If anything, it's been the best it's ever been over the last couple of months. We have spent about $25,000 in just capital costs just to kind of get us through the pandemic, not just with the chairs having to make that change, the parking lot, some cameras, some equipment, and uh, our piano is about gone. I don't know if you guys know that or not, some of you, but we're looking at possibly replacing our piano as well, the, or at least getting it repaired or whatever. So there's a lot of different things we're doing, but uh, the Lord has allowed us financially to be whole, to be stable, to be uh, moving forward, paying off debt, and being able to meet our expenses. And that's been a real blessing, I want to say, because of it's your faithfulness in giving. All of you faithfully giving your tithes and offerings each and every week, especially during that time when our church did not meet. And we had uh, 11 or 12 weeks where we had just online services only. And that was a real blessing to get through that. And we'll continue to pray. Uh, a couple other just reminded of notes of interest is uh, Cornerstone Church in San Francisco, my son's church and many in California, are still not able to meet. They are allowed to meet outside under certain restrictions. But if you're in the inner city, tell me where you're going to go meet outside. Is there going to meet on the street? Uh, and the places they've given them to meet are protest areas where everything is being protested, and you really can't have a church service there. So um, they're not able to meet. Um, North Valley Baptist Church in California has been up to $54,000 in fines for meeting and having church services. And it's every time they meet, it's another $5,000. And uh, so they were, Jack, Jack Trevers, the pastor, I believe, I believe that's his, his church, is a North Valley Baptist Church. And then uh, the rest of California is in some type of a of a hodgepodge of they're not being bothered but they're told they can't meet uh, and that that uh, is all being led by John MacArthur trying to get 1,000 churches every Sunday to meet. Uh, New Jersey, uh, two churches we know of in New Jersey today that are decided we're done, we're going to open today. One of them is my home church and they've decided to have church and they're just going to do what they need to do and uh, praise the Lord for uh, their faithfulness, and we'll see where the Lord takes them. Uh, also in Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, and I understand Massachusetts, they're being fined for having church services if, unless they're outside, and uh, there's some restrictions with that. So we'll talk about, it's not time to talk about the overreaching hand of government, but we do believe that God is moving in spite of all of this, and he will be glorified, and uh, we'll see where the Lord goes. So let's pray for our offering right now, and uh, we're going to pray for that. And appreciate your faithfulness. You can give online. We have, if you're here in the in the uh, facility here, we have our boxes. Both you can give as you come in or leave, or you can give online on our app or on the website as well. And for those watching, we have that on the screen for you to look at. Let's pray for our offering right now. Can we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the faithfulness of God's people. We thank you for the provisions that you give us and how you allow us to give to you. And Lord, we do pray, especially for uh, many churches, not just in America, but in Africa and around the world that are literally on lockdown for uh, the inability to preach and to teach the gospel uh, at this time. And we do lift up, especially North Valley Baptist Church, Cornerstone Church in California, and Open Bible Baptist Church in Williamstown, New Jersey. Lord, I pray for those three churches today that you would use them in a mighty way. Comfort them and encourage them as only you can. Guide and direct as only you can. Bless the giving that we have here today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Now, Iris and Jen uh, have a song, Just As I Am, uh, Just As I Am, I Come. Just time. 
stand together again and we're going to sing a hymn titled Wonderful Merciful Savior. We'll sing three stanzas this morning. book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter number 45, Genesis chapter number 45, and we'll be reading the first 11 verses, our pastor will be bringing a message this morning titled, God's Plan Realized, God's Plan Realized, out of Genesis 45 and verses 1 through 11. The word of God says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And for these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me. Thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And the Lord will add his blessing to our reading of his holy word this morning. 
We're going to conclude our singing this morning with Worthy of Worship. Somewhere. There they are over there, Adam and Kelly, longtime members of our church, and now serving the Lord and, and down in Cincinnati, Ohio area. And uh, we're sorry that the Reds aren't able to play with fans, but that's, we got some fans here for the Reds. But uh, anyway, and they have a, mis a ministry of going, taking short term missions trips. So we've been supporting for a while as they go in medical missions. Adam is a, is a doctor, he got his degree here at um, LeeCom and then decided that. Uh, he would move away from where the Lord wanted him to be and do his residency down in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. And for some reason, they never came back. But uh, we're glad to have both of you here today. Good to see, um, where is Tiffany and uh, Zach? They are here as well. I saw you guys come in. God bless you. And uh, they're going to be moving to the uh, D.C. area soon. Outside D.C., is that correct? And uh, they're going to go clean up the swamp, literally. They're going to do that. So uh, anyway, glad to have them here. And uh, we'll leave all my political comments out of that. But we'll see what happens. We're good to have all of you here this morning, other visitors as well. And we're glad to have everybody here. For the next several weeks, I've decided to uh, take a break from the book of John. We'll get back to John 7. I really enjoyed, honestly, of all the preaching I've done in 21 years, John 6 has been an encouragement. I don't know how it's been for you, but for me it's been incredibly good and invigorating. 
And I thought we'd take a break from that, and I'm going to uh, pick several classic Old Testament passages as we'll go through in an expository nature. And today is one that I believe is right up there in the top ten as far as I'm concerned of encouraging, convicting passages for all of us. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at Joseph revealing to his brothers who he is. Joseph is revealing to his brothers who he is. And we'll look at, I want you to look if you have your Bibles with you, and I want you to look at verse number 6. Verse number 6 kind of gives the highlight of what we're going to look at today. Of course, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was maligned. They told his father that he died and actually brought his coat of many colors back with blood on it to reveal that. He was sold into slavery to the Midianites and then given to Potiphar later. Potiphar would use him as a slave, but he saw that God was with him and made him, all, made him chief of all his house. Potiphar's wife tried to make some advances to Joseph, and she wanted him to have a sexual morality with him, and, and he says, I cannot do this against my God, and so in a spirit of, a, a, a spirit of rage and consistently tempting Joseph, he fled, he left his coat there, and he was accused of inappropriate relationship with her and thrown into prison. <clears throat> and then through a series of circumstances, God was with him, he was in prison, and he was lifted up to be the key, uh, uh, the key gatekeeper at the prison. But yet he was left in the prison for two years after he had uh, interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer. And then that led him to the point where eventually he would be released from prison because the cupbearer remembered Joseph's dreams and Joseph's interpretation of dreams and he would interpret the dreams of Pharaoh and be made king, only sorry, be made head of all of Egypt, only second to Pharaoh. Now all that is being said, there is now a famine going on. A famine that Joseph predicted, excuse me, Joseph had interpreted through Pharaoh's dreams. And because of that famine, Joseph's brothers who 30 years earlier had sold him into slavery would be confronted face to face with their brother they had abandoned in a well then later sold into slavery. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the text in which all of that is revealed and how Joseph will articulate to his brothers that God had a plan. You did not put me into slavery. God sent me before you to save you. Now I want you to look at verse number 6. It says, For these two years, he's explained in the famine, had been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. Now that is an old English way. There's not going to be any plowing or any harvest for five more years. You've only seen two of them, and you're about to starve to death. Verse number 7. And God sent me before you to prepare you a posterity, in other words, a remnant in the earth, and to save your lives by great deliverance, many survivors. Verse number 8. And then it says, So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. It wasn't you that sold me into slavery. It was God had a plan to save you, and it was 30 years in the process. And he had made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I want to preach a message that's simply titled this morning, God's Plan Realized. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do pray that you would, all of us, everyone under the sound of my voice, those here, those who are watching, Lord, that we would look at our trials, our circumstances, and our day-to-day -day discouragement as God's plan for something better <clears throat> later on. Lord, I pray you would fill me with the Spirit, you would guide and direct as only you can. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 
Amen. God's plan for putting Joseph in Egypt was being told later, 30 years later. 30 years of Joseph in turmoil. 30 years of wondering, when will this end? And now it's all coming to a climax and maybe, just maybe, Joseph has put the pieces together why he went through that. Many people have had discouraging circumstances that later on God used in a great and mighty way. There's an evangelist who started Ambassador Baptist Bible College. His name is Ron Comfort. He was born in a dysfunctional home. His mother actually threw him out the window at one time he was a child and almost killed him. At age 14, he sung in bars and nightclubs, really had no formal education. And kindly came to know Christ and met the right people in the right circumstances at the right time that God had planned. And they paid his way to go to a private Christian school and then went on and graduated from Bob Jones University and became a great evangelist. But through all of that, God had a plan. This morning we're going to speak on, I believe we want to maybe call this succeeding in spite of your circumstances. In spite of what's going on, God can move in your life and you can succeed. Everyone who has ever succeeded and had circumstances that were unable, that were, they were uh, to able, able to overcome. And the story, I believe, of Joseph tells us that our character, not our circumstances, is what determines our success in many ways. Our success in the Lord. And no matter how dismal your circumstances may be, no matter how insurmountable it may look, and think about Joseph's life, for crying out loud, God can cause you to rise above that and you can be used by the Lord and who knows if God is not preparing somebody here for something later down the road that will glorify Him. Joseph had become second in command of all of Egypt. He is second only to the Pharaoh. He's in charge of all the treasuries of Egypt. And his brothers who had 30 years before had sold him to slavery are now in this text being brought right before him. These brothers are just now realizing. Now think about this. Oh my. How many of you have ever seen somebody, you recognize them, and you try to avoid them? Raise your hand. <laughs> right? You might be in a grocery store. You might be in the mall. You might be, I hope this would not in church. I know one pastor, he says, every church has about five people when the pastor sees them coming, he says, i got to counsel somebody real quick. Can you come in my office? You know. <laughs> and they realize, oh, no. This can't be Joseph. Do you remember what we did to this guy? Do you remember that we left him for dead? But Judah says, we feel sorry for him. Let's pull him out of the well. And let's go sell him to this entourage that's coming through. That's what we see here. I used to tell my kids that I still tell them, and I say this here, and this is one of those grunts and groans where they roll their eyes. I say, life is unfair, get over it. But really, we have to understand sometimes it's not going to turn out the way we want it. People are unfair. People will hurt you. Your health will fail. Others won't understand. You'll be wrongly accused. You'll have fires that you're constantly putting out in spite that you had nothing to do with starting them. Your spouse may be unfaithful. Where does the list end? But God still can have a plan in your life in spite of your circumstances. I believe the key in all of this and unlocks the keys to this text in Joseph's life is the title, the point of my first base, uh, the point I have up on the screen is his relationship with God, the relationship of God. Genesis 29, when Joseph was in prison, I think is a key to understanding how Joseph survived. How he survived 30 years of one discouragement after another. Because the keeper of the prison, it says in verse 23 of Genesis 39, 
It says the keeper of the prison looked not at anything that was under his hand. In other words, he let Joseph is in charge because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. He saw God in Joseph. How does he succeed in spite of all the negativity? They could see God in him. Do people see God in you and me? Do we see our circumstances nothing but complaining and maligning? And yes, there's a time to cry, as we said on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday night, as we went through uh, Ecclesiastes. There's a time to weep, a time to cry, a time to mourn. No doubt about that. But it's your life one continual crisis after another. Joseph had every right to quit. Had every reason to say, this is not fair. But there was a time, 30 years when all this started, that he would be used to rescue the nation of Israel. How did he, how did he succeed? See, Genesis 37 to 50, Joseph is given more, the character of Joseph is given uh, more space in Genesis than any other character, any other person. From Genesis 37 all the way to chapter number 50, we see revenge, lust, attempted murder, deceit, seduction, violence, false accusation, and imprisonment all against Joseph. His first 30 years were not a picnic. He grew up in a highly dysfunctional home. There was rivalry, partiality. In Genesis 37, 4, it says his brothers hated him so much, when they had the opportunity, they planned to kill him. But they changed their mind, as it says in verse 22 of Genesis 37, and put him in a well so that he died without them touching him. But then they had a better idea, let's make money off this. So some traders came along, they realized they could make a few bucks selling Joseph, and that's how Joseph ends up in Egypt in Potiphar's house. God has a strange way of putting you where he needs you, doesn't he? I remember when I first traveled to Erie, Pennsylvania back in the early 90s, I was working for a consulting company, and I was staying in the Avalon Hotel. And I remember talking to my wife on the phone. And it was February, I was doing some work with GE at the time as a consultant. And she goes, where are you today? Because I traveled a lot and I wasn't away, but I said, I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania. She goes, where's that? And I said, remember, we're from Philadelphia. If you're from Philadelphia, you think the whole world revolves around Philadelphia and nobody else exists. So anyway, I says, well, it's way up in northwestern Pennsylvania. And I've been here two days. It's been snowing. It's never stopped snowing. And she goes, oh, we never live in a place like that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. God has a way of putting us in places that maybe we never would have considered. See, Joseph, there's a lot going on in Joseph's life. Let's look at a couple things. The circumstances of Joseph's life. He was rejected at home. Some of you have been that way. He grew up in a dysfunctional family. And his brothers tried to kill him. Joseph was also slandered at work, if you want to call that, when he went to work to Potiphar. He became elevated in Potiphar's house after being sold to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife made sexual advances toward Joseph. Not once, not twice, but daily. In fact, the word, the Greek word, I mean the Hebrew word that's used there is consistently day after day after day was he tempted. One day the slander took an upper hand when Joseph was returning from work. She was alone. She caused his coat to be left, he left behind after she had tried to get him in her sexual advances. So she goes to her husband, a Hebrew servant. It says the Hebrew servant who he brought among us, he tried to have relations with me, and of course he then says, I'll take care of that, and he put him in prison. So here Joseph did nothing wrong, but yet he was slandered at work, and then he was forgotten in prison. While in prison, he befriended members of the Pharaoh's staff, one of the individuals, a cupbearer, a wine steward for Pharaoh, 
Joseph, through a series of circumstances, helped interpret his dreams, helped him get out of prison, telling him, don't forget about me, don't forget about me here. And it says in the text, he sat there for two years. Can you imagine waiting for two years for somebody to do what they said they were going to do? So he was slandered at work, and he was forgotten in prison. But here's the point. People may hurt you, abuse you, reject you, <clears throat> forget about you. But when the Lord is in your life, you can succeed in spite of your circumstances, no matter what people do, because God is the one directing your path. How did Joseph succeed? Because, look here, the Lord was with him. Number two, let's look at this reunion. Let's go through, I'm just going to walk through this text for a few minutes. Let's look at this reunion. There's so many key words that are good. Let's just walk through that. I want to read it through it and I'll make some comments. So here we are, the big time. They're coming in. I now, I'm speaking as Joseph, realize who they are. I'm going to have them come in. And he says that Joseph could not refrain himself. It means he could not control himself. What an emotional meeting. Joseph now has come to the point he realized what, why he had been put here. By the way, the text earlier doesn't give any indication that Joseph was led to believe all of the circumstances in his life would come to a point where he would rescue his family, but he's now, this is all starting to come together. And it says he could not refrain himself before all them that stood by. And he cried. And he caused every man to go out from me. In other words, all my brothers are here, I want everybody out of the room. Get out. I've got to talk to these folks. He cleared the room. This is an emotional meeting, by the way. And they stirred no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And look at verse number 2. Don't miss it. I think I have it up there. You can read it. It's kind of small. And he wept aloud. Now listen to me. He was weeping so loud. You ever heard somebody wail? I mean, just wail and wail and wail. Usually it's a baby or it's a, a child that screams. You ever heard an adult wail? You ever heard a teenager wail? There's a little more seriousness with that. Joseph is weeping so loud that those he kicked out of the room, it says the house of Pharaoh heard it. Do not take this lightly what was going on. This is not just a casual conversation. He's got his body, soul, don't miss this, and his spirit. This is a big deal. And then it says in verse number 3, And Joseph said unto his brother, Now, think about this. There's three words. I am jo That is, that's a bomb. I, he just dropped a bomb right in the middle of those people. Oh my, he's still alive? Now the first thing, they must be thinking, he's going to kill me. We're dead. We are dead. We are, as they say down south, we're milk toast. Now, notice he says that Joseph says to brother, I am Joseph. And the first thing he says, question mark, does my father get live? And his brother could not answer him. You ever been stunned? You ever had news that came that was so shocking you couldn't say a word? He's wailing, he's hollering, and you're sitting there. Oh, my. His brethren not answer him, for they were troubled, uh, you think? You think? Uh, we're in major, major trouble. They were troubled at his presence. In fact, I have in my Bible, sometimes I'll use my preaching Bible devotions, and I got the word trouble circled, and I would love to show this on the screen, and I got a real theological statement here in my Bible. You know what I wrote next to that? Oh, no. Look at verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, 
uh, get a little closer. I want to. They probably were far off. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come close to me. He says here under his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. And by the way, I'm not forgetting what you did. Look what he said. I'm the brother. You remember? I don't know. Maybe he had another one after me. I have no idea. But, you know, I'm the guy you sold into Egypt. You know what I wrote in my Bible next to that? I still remember. I still remember. So we see the reunion. He made himself known. This is one of the most moving scenes of all of the Bible. Joseph goes, tells his staff to go out of the room. There's an enormous emotional release. He revealed his identity to his brothers. He told them not to grieve later on because of the way they treated him, because God went before them. We haven't covered that yet. He revealed himself. God had planned this for a long time. Drama. They're probably thinking your sin will find you out. No doubt. So we see here this emotion release. Can you imagine what was going on through their mind? This was the last person they wanted to see. At this point, look here, don't miss this, the reunion was a one-way street. You want to see us. We don't want to see you. Three decades. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Number three, the reason for his treatment. Let's look here. The reason for Joseph's treatment. And he goes on and explains all of this. He explains all of this. Look at verse 45, verse number five, please. Now, therefore, this is hard for me to even preach it. I can only imagine how hard it was. Because, you know, there are people sitting here today, no doubt, and I've been there, that absolutely positively can't forgive people. The lack of unforgiveness is a cancer that will destroy you. And you'll go to your grave destroying you and everybody in your family. I've watched it happen. It says in verse number five, this is hard. Now therefore be not grieved or angry with yourselves. He's assuming they were they were convicted. That you sold me hither, or you sold me into slavery. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Now look here. To preserve your life and the nation of Israel's life. The key word is God. For these two years, he's explaining, have been a famine in the land. You know, you guys are starving to death. This is the second trip you've, no, th second trip you've made. You have one more later on. And you know what? Because you're going to bring your family and put them in Goshen. For two years, you guys are hungry. By the way, hunger will do a lot to make you change your, help you change your mind. You know that? Pestilence and hunger was used in the Bible almost all the time for judgment and conviction. And it says there, for these two years had the famine been the land. And it goes, and there are five years in which there shall be neither earing or harvest. That means there'll be no plowing, earing, plowing or harvest. They didn't know that. You know, they did not, they were not under understanding, oh, by the way, there's five more years left, but you got it. Are you kidding me? We're never going to make it out of here. He's telling them what God is doing. He's telling them, I, you, I got two more, you got five more years left. However, look at verse 7. Good stuff. And what's the next word in verse number 7? Everybody say it together. God. He's bringing God to this. Not me. By the way, on my own, I probably want to kill you. He didn't say that. That would kind of take that away. But he sees God. He said, and God sent me before you 
to preserve you a posterity. In other words, a remnant of God's people in the earth. To save your lives by a great deliverance. That word deliverance comes from the Hebrew word. It means there will be many survivors. Everybody look here. He said, God put me here to save you. You didn't do it. God did it. I'm now in charge. I can sell or give away all the grain you need. In fact, it's not only if I can give it away, I've got something better than that. I'll tell you that in a minute. So now, I love verse number 8. Classic, classic verse. If you're in the habit of underlining errors in your Bible, don't miss this. Let me just, he says, I'm going to repeat it one more time. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but who? God. God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look here. Let me just apply this and land this point just for a minute. I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know who bothers you. I don't know what bothers you. I don't know if there's a disease, you know, by the grace of God. But can I say something to you? God has allowed it because he's got a plan in your life. Last week was an incredible week in my 20 years of ministry. I don't want to get into the details, but two people, not one, but two, that had caused some great hurt in my home while pastoring this church. Both, both came to apologies on separate areas in different states, hundreds of miles away, and apologized. And I was broken. I was broken. And not that I'm perfect, I fall far short in whatever happens. But I want to tell you, I did not fight back to either one. I did not call names. But isn't God good when He brings the whole thing around? It could only be one of them I thought I would never hear from ever again. And we find, He says there, He said, but God did it. He made the Father, He made me a father to Pharaoh. I'm over all of the Pharaoh's grain, I'm over all the Pharaoh's. Uh, uh, what, he, what he owns, I am second in command. I'm only second in command only to Pharaoh. Why I'm Pharaoh. And the Lord of all his house and a ruler through all the land of Egypt. And you know what he's saying to him in many ways? When you found me, you had the jackpot when it comes to food. God planned something. Dr. Clarence Sexton gave an illustration years ago he had a member in his church and they were watching this family was watching either a relative or a friend I don't know who they were watching softball game and when you play softball or baseball and you Hit it a certain if you swing too early or too late or you tip the ball, it goes foul. Have I seen a foul ball? Have I known a foul ball? He's even those of you who know nothing about sports, especially if you're from Erie, it's called a foul ball. It goes up in the air and it lands somewhere. If I know what a foul ball is? Well a foul ball got hit up in the air. The way he explained it is make sure I'm in the right camera view here. The way he explained it was the ball went up in the air and one of the daughters of a member of his church was running to catch it and before she caught it she hit the side of a bench or a bleacher and smashed her head right on the ground. Was rushed to the hospital, brain hemorrhaging they thought, swelling, it was awful. And the way that Dr. Sexton explained it he met him at the hospital. Why did God allow this to happen? My daughter didn't do anything. What I can't see, and I'm not going to add to the illustration to make it sound better, 
But maybe he was thinking, why would a God allow this? Wouldn't we all say that? Our child? Would we not? Well, after they did a CT scan of her head and did all this, they found there was some swollenness, but it would be okay, and she'd be okay. But they noticed a dark spot. And behind her eye, I think it was her eye, they found a dark spot. And later, after looking at that dark spot, they realized it was cancer. And God had to use a foul ball and an injury so he could reveal cancer that may have killed that child unbeknownst to them. So I don't know what God's doing in your life. But I do know he's God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. He's God. So we see that. So that's the reason for his treatment. God sent me to preserve your life. Lastly, this is the part we all like. I like the end. If you're like me, I'll get a book. Sometimes I'll look at the last chapter and say, I don't really want to read this. I saw it ended up. Right? I'll get the cliff notes and read the end of it, you know, when I was in college and high school, trying to do a book. But this is the good stuff, and don't miss this. Look at verse number 9, please. Hey, get up! Go get Daddy. Go get my father. By the way, your dad, too. And say unto him, Thus thy son Joseph... God had made him Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me. Tarry not, or don't delay. Now, they didn't say this. We'll learn this later. I'm not going to preach the whole text, but I'm wondering, that, do we have to tell him what we did to you? Do we got to tell him what we did? What I would say is, Dad, you know we did that. Aren't you glad we did it? Because, because we had done that. We wanted to get it. That's not in the text, but I thought I'd, I like to... By the way, the Bible is about real people with real problems just like you and me. And look what it says in verse number 10. This is so good. If you have any idea of the geography of northern Egypt. I mean, we're starving to death. And I know where the... the I've, been, I've been to Israel before and I've been to the, the Holy Land. They're starving to death. and They have nothing in Egypt. But he said, look what he says here. And he said, Haste not to go to my father, say unto thy son Joseph, made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me, tarry not. Verse number 10. And thou shalt dwell in the land of... Now, don't miss that. That's just thrown in there. Oh, I don't know what Goshen is. No, you don't know what Goshen is. Goshen is the well-watered plains of the Nile. That is the highest real estate you can get. It's a good place if you are a farmer, and it's even better if you are a herder of cattle. And you are going to get the highest price real estate around during this time. And even though there was a drought, the Rile River had not dried up. So not only are you going to get food, not only are you going to get taken care of, the immediate, the immediate problem was we have to eat. I'm going to put you in a place where you can prosper. And God is allowing that to happen. And I want to tell all of you, ladies and gentlemen, God has a Goshen for all of us. It doesn't mean we're going to be wealthy. We're going to be have the everything we want materialistically wise. But God wants you in, end up in Goshen. And the only way you're going to get there is to have the character like Joseph and be willing to listen. He says, Goshen, in the land of Goshen, thou shalt be near unto me. I get to see my dad. I get to see all of my brothers. He'll say later, he'll talk about Benjamin. We know the story of Benjamin and Joseph. I won't get into all that. so much here to cover in a message. And thou shalt be near unto me, 
Thou and thy children and thy children's children, thy flocks, thy herds, and all that you have, bring them on. Verse 11. And there will I nourish thee. Because it's five years. So he says, the five more years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all thy hast come to poverty. So, there's the end. And here's the easy part. We know how it ends up. And it'd be easy for us to say, yeah, that was, you know, I understand why I'm doing that because but they, Joseph did not know that. And neither do you. Neither do you. I want all of us to consider this morning before we close. The trials that have gone on before you. And many times we'll get bitter at people. We'll make enemies. We'll get angry. But maybe God's using that because He has a Goshen for us somewhere and we're not going to get there unless we follow Him. I was praying with Walt Silman just before church this morning. I said, the older I get, the more I want. Not everybody may like me. Not everybody may enjoy everything. But I'm not going to let it destroy my life. I'm going to let God use me if He will, wants to. And the easiest thing for us to do, all of us, is to not see God's hand in what's going on. I can't tell you the number of preachers who have quit churches since this pandemic began. Five. I heard another one. Five that I know. I got another one I was talking to last week that wants to quit. Another one. Last week. Yesterday. I mean, the day before yesterday. And I know it's bad in the other world, too. But is that what really God's allowing things to happen? I want you to know that there's a Goshen waiting for you and for me, but it may take a while before we realize it. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I pray for wisdom. I can't preach a message like this and touch a lot of people, including me, and how we have failed to see God's hand in And many times we're known by our reactions rather than the issue. Our reactions become the issue. And Lord, I pray this morning for sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. I pray for God's Spirit to move in the lives of our people and the people watching. With every head bowed and every eye closed, here's the invitation this morning. Could you pray this morning? Maybe you've been abused, maligned. How have you reacted to that? Maybe you've been the maligner. Maybe you need to go and apologize. Maybe somebody's done something in your past 20, 30 years ago that's caused you so much grief a father, a mother, a child, and you haven't handled the world. Or maybe God has used you and will use you to point people to Goshen because of it. Lord, guide and direct. The invitation is wide as the river this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you can remain standing if you want. Let's just pray and ask God to move in our lives. If you're not sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're saved, why don't you pray and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins? 
by something as simple as, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. But I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life and into my heart. Lord, let the Spirit move this morning amongst God's people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You can remain standing.